This audio is brought to you by Muslim Central. Please consider donating to help cover our running costs and future projects by visiting www.muslimcentral.com forward slash donate. next session, session number 27, which is entitled Family Matters, Bridging the Gap Between Ideals and Reality. Our first speaker for this session is Astada yes, Yasmin Mujahid. Yasmin Mujahid has just launched her brand new book, Love and Happiness, which is available here at the RIS booth along with her best-selling book, Reclaim Your Heart, which has received international acclaim. Yasmin is currently an instructor for Al Maghrib Institute, a writer for the Huffington Post, an international speaker, and invited lecturer at Oxford, Harvard, Yale, Stanford, and many other universities around the world. She received her BSc degree in psychology and her master's in journalism and mass communications from University of Wisconsin, Madison. I'd like you all to join me in welcoming Yasmin Mujahid. Assalamu alaikum. Audhu billahi min ash-shaytan al-rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Rabbi shrah li sadri wa yassir li amri wa ahlul uqtatan min lisani ifqahu qawli. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Qur'an in anyone who um, has ever been invited to a Muslim wedding Anyone who's been invited knows this ayah because it's on every Muslim invitation. And from among his signs is this, that he created from you, for you, spouses, that you may dwell in tranquility with them, and he put love and mercy between you. Now there's a lot that we can take from this ayah, but the reason I want to begin with this ayah is because the topic today is about bridging this gap in terms of family, bridging the gap between ideal and reality. But before we can bridge that gap, we have to know what ideal is. What does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say should this relationship be based on? And so I want to make a couple of reflections about this ayah because it gives us that foundation of what this relationship should be based on. And I want to make another very important point because I believe that a lot of our families have fallen apart because of losing this one concept. And that is that I believe that a lot of our families, once children come into the equation, the, the foundation of the family no longer becomes the marriage, and it becomes the children. And that's actually a mistake. The foundation of a family is the marriage. And when the marriage is strong, the family is strong. But when we start to shift that focus, and instead we give precedence, and we, and we in fact do injustice to the marriage for the sake of the children, when we do that, we are actually harming the children and the marriage and the family. And so what we have to do from the very beginning is understand that the foundation of a strong family is a strong marriage. And this idea that investing in your marriage is being selfish needs to be removed. That people need to go back to investing in their relationship. And they need to stop making the entire focal point the children. That becomes unhealthy not only to the children but even to the marriage and the family itself. I, as I put it, a lot of our uh, parents, they start to take their children and put their children at the center and do tawaf around them. Like, like, like literally put the children let's be honest, namely the boys, the sons, they put them at the center and they do tawaf around them. And what happens is this creates a lot of issues. 
social issues, psychological, a lot of problems because of this. Because of this lack of balance, where you've taken your son, your son, the son, the, your son, your child, is where the sun, S-U-N, rises and sets, right? And this is a problem for many reasons. But one of the reasons which is relevant to what I'm speaking about today is it can do injustice to the marriage. Because what happens, and I'll just give you one example, things like um, mothers sleeping next to their child and the husband sleeping alone. This is an imbalance. This isn't the way that, that the structure should be in a family. The foundation is the marriage, and that is the center and the foundation of the rest of the family. But when people shift that balance and make it imbalanced, that's when you get problems later on. And you find many cases then later on where the marriage, or rather the husband and the wife, have become just parents. They've become just parents living under a roof, right, over time. Well, what happens when you neglect a relationship? What happens if you neglected a relationship with a friend or, 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 or a colleague or anyone? What happens is you start to move apart. And what happens in these situations is that these people have neglected their relationship for so long that over time they just became two parents living under one roof. And some stay together just for the children. And then some of them, when the children move out, that's when they separate. These kinds of things can be avoided if we invest from the beginning in the marriage and not make the children at the center. This is very important. And believe me, you will make the children more healthy if the marriage is healthy and strong. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ أَنْ خَلَقَ لَكُمْ مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ أَزْوَاجًا لِتَسْكُنُوا إِلَيْهَا وَجَعَلَ بَيْنَكُمْ مَوَدَّةً وَرَحْمًا So the first thing I want to reflect upon in this ayah is the, the sukoon part. That Allah says that we're supposed to find tranquility in our spouses. Now, this isn't always the case, but it's important for us to know how it should be so that we can recognize when something has gone wrong. We have to be able to know how it should be so we can recognize when something goes wrong, right? And if something goes wrong, we should know how to respond. So to begin with, how should it be? Well, it's supposed to be a place of tranquility. The marriage is supposed to be a place of sanctuary. It's supposed to be a shelter from the storm. It's not supposed to be the storm that you leave the house to go to shelter. It's supposed to be the shelter itself so that there is stress outside. There is stress. There is storms outside. But you're supposed to be able to find shelter within that relationship. That relationship, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes it, لِتَسْكُنُوا إِلَيْهَا For you to find tranquility in one another. So it is, it's supposed to be that shelter or that sanctuary in the storm. And unfortunately, a lot of cases, it's the opposite where the storm is inside the house and people go outside to find shelter. The other point I want to make is the mawadda and the rahma. This, uh, this, this uh, expressed love, mawadda, comes from the root word uh, al wadu of, of, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the attribute of Allah al wadud, the one, the source of love and the most loving and the source of all love and rahma from Ar-Rahman and Ar-Rahim, this mercy that Allah says He put between the spouses expressed love and mercy. So again, it shows us what's supposed, what it's supposed to be like. And if these things are missing, then we know that something is not right. These are the ideals now, okay? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also describes the spouses as garments for one another. Libas. Now, if you look at a garment, I could say that a garment has maybe three main roles that it plays. The first is that a garment actually beautifies. This is why people put in so much money into the fashion uh, sector, so much money into the fashion industries, because clothes actually are supposed to beautify. They don't only cover, but they also beautify. And similarly, a spouse is supposed to beautify the other spouse. What does that mean? It means to, to help the person become better, to beautify the person. Your, your marriage is supposed to be a means to get 
to become a better person, to become closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's a character builder. And that's not always easy, obviously. Building anything isn't easy. Building muscle, ask anyone who goes to the gym. It's not easy. But it's something that makes you a better person. It beautifies you in the end. Secondly, a garment covers. And this is very important. A spouse is meant to cover the defects in the other spouse. And of course, I have to put a footnote here. This doesn't mean that if there's abuse, that you cannot seek help for that. So sometimes this is one of the main uh, misconceptions that people have that keep them from seeking help, that keep them from seeking professional counseling, is they think, well, I cannot expose their flaws or their faults. Yes, in general, when you're sitting in a, in a gathering or you're with your girlfriends or, with your, or you're with your, your male friends, if, if men are with their male friends talking about their wives or women are talking about their husbands, that's what it's referring to. You don't, you don't expose the faults and the flaws of your spouse in that way. But if you are going to seek help, then that's not considered backbiting. That's not what it's referring to. So when you're in public, for example, you don't make jokes mocking the, 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 the other spouse or, or exposing something about them, but rather a garment covers, covers. So if we have a defect uh, or, a, or a scar on our body, the garment's gonna cover that, right? It's not gonna expose that. And it's not a very effective garment if it's exposing that. It's not doing one of its jobs. And another thing that a garment, it, it, the, the garment of a spouse does is it covers a person's chastity. It helps a person to keep their own chastity. That that's one of the roles that we play as a spouse for one another. That we help one another to stay loyal and to lower our gaze and to be modest and to be chaste. And lastly, it protects from the cold. For example, right now, we're in the middle of winter in Toronto. So it's cold, it's been snowing. But you put on a jacket and that keeps you warm. So the garment in that sense is protecting you. It protects you, garments protect you from rain. If you put on a, a, if you put on a rain jacket, it protects you from rain. It protects you from cold. It protects you from heat if you put on certain garments to cover you from the, from the sun. And in the same way, your spouse is supposed to protect you. A spouse is supposed to be a protector for the other spouse. Now, I've talked briefly, very briefly, about the ideal. But in life, we don't always get the ideal. You know, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches us the very powerful and beautiful dua in the Quran, رَبَّنَا هَبْ لَنَا مِنْ أَزْوَاجِنَا وَذُرِّيَاتِنَا قُرَّةَ أَعْيُنْ وَجْعَلْنَا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ إِمَامًا is a very important word in this, in this dua, and that's heblana. Oh Allah, give us the gift. See, give us the gift of making our spouses and our children the coolness of our eyes. A, a source of comfort. But see, notice that the word used here is gift. Hiba is a gift. Heblana, give us the, the hiba, the gift of this. Which means... Now what a gift, is a gift deserved or can you buy it? You know, someone, someone's giving you a gift. Have you paid for it? Do you necessarily deserve it? No, a gift is just given because the giver is generous and the giver is al-wahab and he loves to give gifts. So we have to also recognize that this is a na'mah. It's a, it's a blessing, it's a type of provision but it isn't necessarily something that everyone gets, and it isn't necessarily something that's only given to the deserving. This is a very important point as well, because we have a lot of judgmental attitudes in our community. For example, when we see families that are going through difficulty, when we see broken families, when we see divorces, when we see children who are suffering, we, standing from where we are, perhaps maybe we've been gifted with our children and our spouses being the coolness of our eyes, it's a gift. But maybe we're looking at others and judging them. That maybe they're not as good as us and that's why they got divorced. And that's why their kids are off the right track. You know what I'm saying? This very judgmental and honestly arrogant attitude. And by the way, it's extremely dangerous because guess what happens when you are not grateful for a gift? 
When you are not grateful for a gift, you can become tested in those gifts and those gifts can be taken away from you. It's like a person who's been gifted with health and looks at someone who's sick and judges them and says, you know what, it's because they're just not as good as me. They don't work out as much as me or they don't eat as much raw, organic, greeny, green vegetables as me. You know what I mean? And, and you judge that person and you, and you shame that person. We would never do that. Because we realize that health is a gift, hopefully. Same thing with wealth. If you have money, you've been gifted with that money. Don't think that it's only because of your hard work. Because guess what? There are children working in sweatshops who are working harder than you. And they're not making the money you're making. So at the end of the day, we have to understand that all these things are provisions and they are gifts. And Allah very accurately puts it, he uses the word hiba, which is a gift. That make our, our, our spouses and our children the coolness of our eyes. This is a gift. So be careful. If you have it, be grateful. Don't be arrogant. And do not take credit for it. That's very important. I'll tell you one of the pitfalls we fall into as as parents and as spouses. Imagine that you've been gifted with a righteous child. Please don't take credit for it. Please thank Allah. Please be grateful. Because I will tell you, you are not better than Nuh alayhi salam. And he was not gifted with a righteous child. And it's not because he was lacking. Do you understand? So the point here is be grateful for your gifts. Do not be arrogant and do not take credit. What happened to someone who took credit for what he had? As we know in the Quran, we're given the story of Qarun. Qarun was a man who had so much wealth. Allah describes in Surah Al-Qasas. He had so much that the, the keys to his wealth was wealth. That's how much he owned. And he used to be very arrogant. And when people would tell him to be grateful, he said, Inna ala ilmin indi, That I got all of this because of a knowledge in me. Do you see what he's doing? He's taking credit for what he has. He says, because of me, it's because I'm so smart. And sometimes we have this attitude. But Allah shows us what happened to him. Allah says that the earth swallowed him and his home. That's pretty intense. And I mean, sometimes I used to read about this and be like, how does that even happen? And then I learned about this thing called sinkholes, and I was like, OMG. <laughs> it's like a real thing. <laughs> All right, so the point here is that he was taking credit for his gifts. Be mindful never to take credit. Your children, if they are righteous and on the straight path, it is because Allah has protected them, and Allah has guided them, and Allah has gifted you with that. And always remember that even prophets had issues within their family. Lut alayhi salam's wife was not righteous. That's not because he was a bad husband. Ibrahim alayhi salam's father was one of those who was making the idols. Asiya alayhi salam, she was married to the worst tyrant who walked the earth, who used to say, Ana rabbukum al-a'la. I am your Lord most high. Why do we learn about these stories? Because on the one hand, yes, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us the ideal. He tells us how it should be. But then he's also giving us examples that even the most righteous had issues in their family. And we need to number one, stop being so judgmental. And stop thinking that we are better. Because we've been given a specific gift and someone else hasn't. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He passes out His gifts according to His wisdom. It doesn't mean that if you're better, you get, you get this gift. And if you're worse, you, get, you don't get that gift. That's not how it works. Because as you know, some of the worst people have health, have wealth, and even have good families. Isn't it? We have people who, who may curse Islam and they're still given some of these things. So don't, don't think that way. Now, what should we do? I don't have much time left, but what I want to leave you with is a principle. Sabr doesn't mean turning the other cheek. Patience, sabr, doesn't mean you allow yourself to be abused. It is not righteousness to allow yourself 
or your children to be abused. In fact, yourself and your children are an amana. They are a trust given to you by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you will be asked about that trust. And if you put your children in a situation where they are in danger or they are being abused and you allow that, you will be asked by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what did you do to protect your children? So please, please do not swallow this this narrative that you're being righteous by turning the other cheek and being passive you're not that's not what the prophet ﷺ said to do he said if you see something wrong you have to try to change it please don't buy into this idea that islam is a is a passive deen it's not it's extremely active it is an active deen we're supposed to be people of action when we see injustice, we have to take action. We cannot turn the other cheek. That's, that's a different religion. That's not our religion. So when you see something wrong, the Prophet ﷺ said, you have to try to change it with your hand. And if you cannot, then with your tongue. By speaking out against it. And if you cannot do any of that, then at the least you have to hate it in your heart. And this is the weakest of Iman. Look at that. The Prophet ﷺ has linked Iman, faith, with taking action against injustice. So don't let anyone make you believe that you are being a, a more righteous Muslim by, by putting up with injustice, by putting up with abuse. It is part of your worship to take action against abuse and against injustice. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not approve of injustice by himself or by anyone else. There's a hadith in which the Prophet ﷺ said, help your brother. If he is the oppressor or he is oppressed, أو كما قال. Whether, help your brother, if he is the oppressor or he is oppressed. And the companion said, we know how to help him if he's the oppressed, but how do we help him if he himself is the oppressor? And the Prophet ﷺ said, by stopping him from oppressing. That's how you help your brother or your spouse is by stopping them from oppressing. أقول قولي هذا واستغفر الله لي ولكم إنه غفور رحيم سبحانك الله بحمدك أشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت استغفرك وأتوب إليك